بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه ثم ما بعد to proceed inshallah today we'll talk about marital harmony and inshallah this will be a series of maybe three uh, sessions uh, talking about marital harmony maybe in the first session we'll talk about some of the guiding principles the importance of marital harmony and some of the guiding principles and the second session will be about practical tips and the third session will be about conflict resolution okay so marital harmony uh, why is it important that we talk about marital harmony some of you are married and some of you are not married uh, and, and certainly if, if you're not married one day inshallah you will uh, but why is it so important that we address the issue of marital harmony? I'll tell you one hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu to tell you how, how important that issue is. Not only for the community, because we always talk about things from a communal or societal perspective as if the individual does not matter much. And we should certainly walk away from this. We, we value... Uh, that we, we value the well-being of the community. But as Muslims, we also value the well-being of the individual. Uh, there, there, is, there is a lot of uh, stuck that we put into the individual, not just the community. So now, whenever we talk about the importance of family, we talk about the importance of family as the smallest unit in the structure of the society. As if we're communists, like, you know, we have like a, a structure and we're, we're ensuring the uh, well-being of every unit in that structure, as if we are, as individuals, numbers in that big structure. And this is a communist way of thinking that maybe many Muslims have been affected by because many Muslims did grow up in countries where they have been affected by communism. Uh, which you, uh, they used to call socialism or whatever they called. And not that socialism is, is like, not that they are synonymous. Socialism and communism are different. But it was communism in disguise in many Muslim countries. So we are we're usually uh, basically told that this is good for the community, this is good for the society, which is important. The well-being of the society is important. But Islam also, and primarily, came from the well-being of each and every individual, and the salvation of each and every individual, their well-being in this life and the one to come. So yes, the family uh, is an important unit in the structure of the community, but the well-being of the family will first impact the individuals that make up this family. The Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith reported by Al-Hakim, authentically, مَنْ رَزَقَهُ اللَّهُ مْرَأَةً صَالِحَةً فَقَدْ أَعَانَهُ عَلَى شَطْرِ دِينَهِ فَلِيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي الشَّطْرِ الْآخَرِ So whomsoever Allah grants with a righteous wife, Allah had helped him out with half of his deen, meaning half of his religious commitment. So let him fear Allah concerning the other half. So let him fear Allah concerning the other half. This is very powerful, right? You know, uh, the word shatr is not does not necessarily mean half, by the way. Uh, shatr means one out of two. Uh, one out of two does not necessarily mean half, the mathematical half. It just means one out of two. Do you know what this means? Like, we have taharat al-batin and taharat al-zahir. We have the purification of the interior and purification of the exterior. We say this is shatr and this is shatr. This uh, taharat al-batin and taharat al-zahir, one out of two, one out of two, because we have two taharas, the tahara of the interior, the purity of the interior, and the purity of the exterior. So we say that tahara of the exterior is shatr al-tahara, is, is one out of two parts of tahara. Does it mean that it is the mathematical half? No, it's not, because the tahara of the exterior is in no way half of, is in no way equal to the tahara of the interior. The tahara of the interior, or the purity of the interior, is much more superior to the purity of the exterior. So when we say shatras, we are not always meaning the mathematical half, but it just, it means one out of two parts. 
So Allah helped him out with one out of two parts of his religious commitment. And you could certainly sit down and basically reflect on what it means that Allah helped him out with one out of two parts. What are the two parts? Maybe in, inside you know, uh, his home, outside uh, his home, you know, family life being half of your, your interactions. Uh, usually your interactions with human beings are either uh, family interactions or financial interactions. Uh, business interactions and so the family in terms of the interactions with with human beings you're either interacting at the family level or at the business level uh, so that's one out of half or maybe the Prophet ﷺ wanted to underscore the importance of uh, the family life the importance of harmony with, inside the family the importance of the well-being of this institution this unit and the uh, a structure or this uh, an institution of a uh, family. So, مَنْ رَزَقَهُ اللَّهُ مُرَأَةً صَالِحًا Try to memorize as much as you can and if you can't memorize verbatim, memorize the meaning. مَنْ رَزَقَهُ اللَّهُ مُرَأَةً صَالِحًا means whomever Allah grants with a righteous woman, meaning a righteous wife. Does that it, would the opposite apply? Yes, the opposite will apply. Unless there is a reason for us to say the opposite does not apply, then the opposite always applies. Unless there is a reason to say the opposite does not apply, the opposite always applies. Which means what? Whomever Allah grants her with a righteous husband, Allah had helped her out with half of her deen. Uh, I believe that it applies because I don't see why it would not apply. You need to, you need to actually tell us why it would not apply. So when Ibn Qayyim says that you don't shave the head of the, the girl, you know, the newborn uh, girl, he says that the Prophet ﷺ instructed this concerning that Hassan, he's a boy, and girls are different from boys. We don't shave girls, we don't shave women's hair ever. You know, even when they go to Hajj, they don't shave their hair. Uh, so I have a reason to tell you, don't, you know, this does not apply to newborn girls. But otherwise, it, the opposite should always apply. Uh, so whenever, boy, you know, boys are mentioned, men are mentioned, it, this would be applicable to girls or men, and vice versa. So, مَنْ رَزَقَهُ اللَّهُ مْرَأَةً صَالِحًا Whomever Allah grants with a righteous wife, فَقَدْ عَانَهُ عَلَى شَطْرِ دِينِهِ Then Allah had helped him out with half of his deen, meaning half of his religious commitment. You know, so your religious commitment, your adherence to the religion, has been facilitated for you. you half of the journey is done, or half of the work is done for you, uh, and you, you've been covered for half of the work that you need to do. فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي الشَّطْرِ الْبَاقِفِ And then let him fear Allah concerning the other half. Uh, you, you could always, I mean, anyone who's married in this particular crowd here would be able to tell how vital it is to your emotional and psychological stability and well-being uh, to, to, to have peace at home, to have peace, to have sakina, to have tranquility, to have peace, to have compassion at home. Whether you are a husband or a wife, uh, it is extremely vital to the well-being of married people. You could, you know, if you have peace at home, you could handle a lot of stress outside. You could handle a lot of stress at work, you know, at school or work or wherever you go, uh, whatever other endeavors you have in life, you could, you know, basically uh, live up to the challenges and handle them and manage them. Uh, but when the, when the home environment is chaotic, when the home environment is tense, you're crippled inside and outside, not just inside. You're, you're just crippled all around. So, th so this is extremely important. And 
and, and so we, it is important for us to talk about marital harmony because you're basically locked into this relationship together. And it is extremely important for your well-being and it is extremely important for your religious commitment, not just your well-being in this dunya, not just in your happiness and stability in this dunya, but for your religious commitment, for the greater cause, you know, your, the, you, the greater cause of your existence. Your religious commitment, your work for the akhirah will be facilitated if you have tranquility and peace at home. And you're locked into this, and the way out is perilous, is dangerous. You know, so basically, to, to exit from that uh, uh, relationship, uh, it, it, it involves a lot of uh, turmoil and it is usually very consequential for your life afterwards particularly if you had children together but not only that even if you did not have children together it's still consequential and I'm not trying to, to cause you despair I'm not trying to scare you or uh, like whoever had like a, a, a failed uh, attempt at marriage I'm not trying to, to basically cause you to uh, regret what, what happened because we don't do this, we move on, we always move on. You know, the, the, this thing teaches us positivity. You don't look behind, you look forward and you move on. You start from here and you fix your life from now, not from yesterday. Unless there, there are certain things that you need to fix, like you have wronged people and oppressed people and you need to fix that. But, but generally speaking, uh, you know, you, you don't look uh, back at your failures, except to learn for the future, not to sit and lament uh, over the past. So the way out is talaq, is divorce, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that, uh, opened that, you know, I don't want to say opened it, but basically provided a way out of that institution when it becomes a complete failure provided a way out from that relationship when it becomes, you know, debilitating, you know, crippling, disastrous for both parties, it could become like this. So that is why talaq, the part of the wisdom of tashriya is that Allah provided us with an exit. Keep in mind that this is even uh, in, that this is more in the interest of the women than it is in the interest of men because in any failed relationship, which party suffers the most? The weaker party. And I, this is not being sexist or anything, but, but if, you, if you have not lost your mind, uh, you, you know that the weaker party is usually uh, the woman in the relationship. So the, the, if, if there was no way out, then you, you basically, you're, you're locking those two individuals in this relationship, and you have one party that is dominant in the relationship, uh, and it is, a, it, it is a failed relationship, but they are locked into it. You can't imagine if this woman has to live with this man for the rest of her life, 30 years, for 40 years, however many years they will have together, how, uh, oppressive that could be to that woman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided an exit. Yet, when Allah provided this exit, do you think that this exit, that, that is just like a, an open door? You know, you walk in, you walk out whenever you want. Do you think that divorce is permissible? Is divorce permissible? Okay. when it is warranted. Divorce is not permissible. We usually say this, but the, yeah, if, if, you, if you want to say that there is a hadith, the hadith is not authentic. The hadith that says, in abghat al-halali and Allah talaq, or the, the most hated permissible act in the sight of Allah is divorce, it is not authentic. And if it is authentic, and some, some scholars may authenticate it, or may consider it acceptable at least, 
It does not mean that divorce is permissible. It means that it would be hated when it is sort of triggered, provoked. There is some justification for it. But divorce is basically like marriage. Is marriage permissible, wajib, mubah, mustahab, makruh? It's all the above. Sometimes it is permissible, sometimes it is haram, sometimes it is makruh, sometimes it is wajib. And divorce is like marriage. If walking in it takes all of those five legal values, wajib, mustahab, mubah, makruh, haram, then walking out takes the same five legal values. It could be any uh, one of those. Uh, but per default, per default, if you're just a so, so a divorce is any, any one of those. And the default is not permissibility. At least according to the Hanafis and Ibn Taymiyyah's choice within the Hanbali Mazhab, divorce is haram, per default. Basically, a divorce that is not justified is haram. So the default for a divorce is haram. That's, a, that's the, the position in the Hanafi Mazhab and Ibn Taymiyyah's choice in the Hanbali Mazhab. It makes perfect sense. Not only that it makes perfect sense uh, by reason, it makes perfect sense also going through the, the adilla or the proofs, the textual proofs, the Quran and the Sunnah. Whoever said that divorce is not harmful, like, like if a man just decided to, uh, you know, so, so he, he lived with her for 10 years, just got bored, you know, wanted to change. He's making more money. He figured he could have like a better wife. He bought a better car and he just decided, you know, I will have another wife to suit the car or to suit the new house, just change wives. Would, would, would that be halal? Does it entail harm to the wife? Does divorce entail harm? Absolutely it does. You know, it, it is devastating sometimes. So if it entails a harm, didn't the Prophet say, la darar wa la dirar, there should be no harm or reciprocation of harm? He did. But not only this, we're not going to only, you know, call it haram from the qawaid or the legal maxims. But we're going to call it haram from specific evidence. And it's reported by Muslim from Jabir radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Iblis yada'u arshahu ala al-ma. Iblis puts his throne over the water. Thumma yaba'asu saraya. And then he dispatches his troops. So the closest to them out of his troops will be the one to cause the greatest fitna. You know fitna because we always try to like sit down and translate fitna. He, he will co cause corruption, he will cause deviation, he will cause sedition, he will cause fitna, can take all of those meanings. So, فَأَدْنَاهُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ زِرَةً أَعْظَمُهُمْ فِتْنَةً يَجِيءُ أَحَدُهُمْ فَيَقُولْ مَا زِلْتُ بِهِ حَتَّى فَعَلَ كَذَا وَكَذَا فَيَقُولْ مَا صَنَعْتَ شَيْئًا One of them will come back to Iblis and say, I, can, I, I, I sort of kept on urging him until he did such and such. And then Iblis will tell him, you have not done anything. Al-Hakim has another report with a different wording, but I'm using the report of Muslim because it, it is more relevant to this particular topic. 
And then one of them will come and say, ما زلت به حتى فرقت بينه وبين امرأته. I continued to urge him and I tell I caused a rift or separation between him and his wife. And then Iblis will say to him, and, نعم and, yes, you are the one. You're the closest to me. You're the one who caused the greatest corruption, deviation, uh, and uh, harm to, to, to that species, humanity. So, if you, if you reflect on this hadith, it, it just means that talaq is the work of the shaitan, right? Isn't it, doesn't it mean that? Is, isn't it obvious? Talaq is the work of the shaitan. Is the work of shaitan a good thing? It must not be. Therefore, I truly believe in the position of the Hanafis and Ibn Taymiyyah's choice that talaq per default is impermissible. And then you need to provide justification. You're not going to provide this justification to the court because it will be hard to require uh, you know, that justification in the court. Because the, the family matters are based in concealment, sitr, concealment, privacy. So Allah will not require this of you. But you will need to provide that justification when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. So if divorce is not the answer, then we have to work it out. Well, we have to work it out. And if divorce is permissible and you do have a justification, Allah still told you, Wa bil ma'roof. So live with them in ma'roof. And ma'roof would be, we, we, you know, ma'roof is just another word. Uh, it says here, in kindness, you know ma'roof. Okay, <laughs> good, because I had to sit down and translate Maruf, it takes time. So live with them in kindness. You could just use kindness for now. Live with them in kindness. And if you dislike them, then you may dislike a thing and Allah makes therein much good. So Allah is telling you, even if, there, even if it is warranted, and even if you have come to the point where you truly dislike your spouse, maybe you will dislike a thing and Allah will make therein much good. Be patient. Try to stick it out. Try to, to carry on. Be patient. Persevere. Because, because you may think, and unfortunately some of the, you know, some of the dua nowadays, they try to make light of divorce, you know, for men and women. They try to make light of divorce as if it is like, what? That's fine. You guys are not getting along, you know. Uh, and it's, it's part of the individualism that, that is part of the culture, part, part of the mainstream culture, individualism. Like, you, you're, not, you're not basically considering the interest of the other party. You're not considering the interest of your children. You're not considering the interest of your parents. The divorce of the child is traumatic to the parents. So you're not, it is this individualistic approach to life that doesn't, you know, where people just don't, don't mind anything. They, they don't care about anybody else. So you're not factoring, factoring in all of these uh, aspects. But Allah tells you to, to, to endure and try to be patient. But then at the end, if it, if, if it is not working out, then Allah did provide an exit. If it is not working out, it is causing harm to, to the two parties. You, you as the wife fear that you will not be able to be dutiful towards your husband, then you ask for it. And if you are not granted divorce, then you ask for khula. If you fear, if you deep inside fear that you will not be able to be dutiful and to discharge your obligations towards this, you know, 
in the family and this man, then you do this. And if you are the husband, then Allah gave you the power to end that uh, relationship in the most beautiful way that you can. Okay, so if divorce is not the answer, or at least it is not the uh, first answer, it is not the spontaneous answer, it is the last resort, and if it is extremely important and vital for our well-being as individuals that we have harmony in, inside the family, then we, we ought to spend so much time uh, basically learning about this issue. We, we ought to seek a lot of knowledge. You go, to, you go to a school for four years and then two years of master's or three or, and four or five of PhD if you pursue that, just to secure your career. And that is one aspect of your life, but your family life, you, ne you never seek to sort of educate yourself about this issue. And someone may say, so why are the Mashaykh monopolizing all disciplines of knowledge and all discipline, or everything about life? So why is it you guys have to teach people about, you know, family harmony? Why can't psychologists do this? Why can't doctors do this? Why can't, you know, thinkers of any walk of life do this? We're not monopolizing anything. You know, if anyone wanted to contribute to this discussion, everybody is welcome to contribute to this discussion on hikmah dallatul mu'min. It's not a hadith, but it is an acceptable statement that the, the scholars sort of accepted. And hikmah dallatul mu'min, wisdom, is the pursuit of every believer. Wherever you find it, you're most deserving of it. Uh, so yeah, that's fine. You could listen to psychologists. We just w plead to psychologists to not talk about haram and halal unless they're, they're talking from knowledge, you, they, are, they have knowledge. You could be a psychologist and you could, and have knowledge in halal and haram. So we plead to people just to steer away from the area of halal and haram, but everybody can contribute to this discourse because we need everybody's input. This is a very vital issue and a very multifaceted issue. So we need everybody's input, yet, yet, you have to also understand why does the religion have a great deal of input concerning this issue? Uh, because this deen was revealed by Allah, the one who created us. And this deen was revealed for our well-being, our welfare in this life, right? So if that extremely important aspect of our lives will be overlooked by God, will not be addressed by God. Well, God will not... Uh, if the... Okay. If this issue will not be addressed by God, then the deen is incomplete. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regula regulated family matters more than he regulated financial transactions, less than he regulated the area of worship, but more than he regulated financial transactions because basically the deen or the laws are about your interaction with Allah, that's ibadat, and your interaction with the creation, that's mu'amalat. When it comes to your interaction with Allah, ibadat, this area has been very regulated, right? Area of ibadat, a lot of ayat and hadith regulate how you pray, how you fast, how you make hajj in the minutest detail. In the area of mu'amalat, the uh, the most regulated section of the area of mu'amalat or interactions is the area of family and then the area of financial transactions. Basically your mu'amalat are either mu'amalat with human beings or mu'amalat with non-human beings. Your mu'amalat with human beings are two big parts. You know, family and business. That's what people do, right? Family, business. So. The area of family has been second only to the area of worship. 
you know, the laws in the area of family, this, this sphere has been second in terms of the regulation to the area of worship. And you look at any, you look at the ayat of the Quran, you look at the ayat of the Quran addressing the uh, laws of family, and you look at the ayat of the Quran addressing financial laws. Anyone who is familiar with the Quran would be able to tell that Allah addressed family laws in much more detail than he addressed financial transactions. You, you, you could also say that the laws of inheritance, al-fara'id, which the Prophet Sallallahu called, called it, you know, that it is one third of the, the, the laws. You could also say that this area is also uh, pertinent to family, not, it, it is more pertinent to family than the financial transactions, even though it, in, it includes finances, but everybody would be able to uh, basically see that how it is more relevant to family. You know, the inheritance, you pass on your inheritance or your estate to your family members, and the, the divisions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated with great detail and great detail in the Quran. Everybody knows that. So this is an area that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a lot of importance to. So it is expected that this area, that, that divine guidance should be central in your learning of these issues. The divine guidance. So as a Muslim, you should reach out for divine guidance first, but it does not mean that other forms of human contribution to this discourse are excluded or that we're monopolizing the discourse. Other forms of human contribution can be accommodated if they are not conflicting, contradicting the divine uh, guidance. It is also important to, uh, to know that Muslims do have the, you know, Islam is about submission. And if you tell any Muslim husband or wife that this is what God said, versus telling them this is what my professor in second year of college said, or this is my professor who basically uh, advised me on my masters, told me. Do you, do you see the difference? basically in the Muslim's acceptance of the instruction, which again does not mean that we're rejecting human contribution to the discourse. We are not rejecting that, but we're saying that central to this is the divine guidance. Because it is expected the divine would provide guidance concerning this area, given the importance of this sphere of uh, basically human life. And it is uh, expected that people will receive this with more submission and more respect if it is coming from God. Now I have, you know, next time inshallah we'll talk about practical tips that will help us have harmony in the family. But the, today we'll talk just about some guiding principles. The first guiding principle that we have to be aware of, which is really important and central to, to our, uh, the well-being of our uh, relationships, all of our relationships, but particularly within the family, is the purpose of our creation. You just need to reflect on this. And wallahi, if people are completely cognizant, completely aware of the purpose of their existence, the purpose of their creation, they will not be wasting time fighting uh, over pity matters with their spouses, uh, it, 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 no one will have time. No one will have, well, no one will be generous with his effort to spend on uh, tr trivial things, superfluous things. Look at, you know, look at the tragic events that took place in France uh, last night. Look at how quickly people were celebrating, you know, how, uh, very tragic, very sad. Uh, very criminal, but but look also at how in the in you know this was the climax of celebration in in France, and people were happy. People were 
uh, cheerful, uh, a sort of unsuspecting of anything, and just within seconds, 84 people lost their lives. So as Muslims, we should really be stingy with our time, with our effort. Like, you should not have time to argue. Why, why is it that we have all the time to argue with each other as spouses? Why can't we just uh, basically be a little bit more uh, like intelligent? Can, can we be a little smarter and just you know, be stingy with our times, with our effort? We should not be arguing. Let's just fix it. Let's just resolve it. And sometimes people argue over where, where should we place the couch. I think the couch should go here. No, I think the couch should go there. And this could start an argument. How trivial is your life? Like, how small do you think of yourself? Like, just, this is very telling of the smallness of your thought, whether you're this side or that side, by the way. It should not be an issue. And particularly if you are the man, if you are the husband, it should never be an issue. You just save it for some other, <laughs> some other argument. Uh, but, but this should never be an issue. So basically being cognizant of the purpose of your creation. I am here for a short time for a particular cause, a particular purpose. The pleasure of Allah is my main objective here. I am not going to be distracted and I'm not going to waste time doing any of this stuff. Arguing, fighting, you know, and, and spending my energy uh, in disputing with my spouse. There are some inevitable disp disputes that I will have to be part of, that I'll have to engage in. Uh, but with my spouse, we should really be, you know, better than this. So this is the first guiding principle, is that you should always be focused on the, the cause of your existence, the cause and the purpose of your creation, and not waste time and not allow yourself to be distracted by petty disputes with your spouse. The second is basically to know your duties before your rights. And we're always like, uh, we human beings in general are like this. Uh, we always think of our, we're, we're impartial, we're, we're partial, human beings are partial. Human beings by nature are egotistic. They think of their own na the interest, it, which, which means that you need to put effort. Human beings by nature are racist, you know that? Because racist is part of this egotistic uh, inclination or tendency. You need to put effort to not be a racist, put effort, in, like to, to work on your heart to not be a racist. You need to work on your heart to not be partial, to not be selfish, to not be egotistic. Tribalism, nationalism, clanism, uh, groupism, classism, uh, racism, all of these things are manifestations of one thing at the end of the day, egotism because all of these will be circles surrounding you. Because if you are racist, then you're basically not uh, cheering another race. You're not rooting for another race, for your own, for your own race, for your own nation, for your own clan, for your own tribe, for your own family. And at the end of the day, at the center of all of those circles, for yourself, and that that is why you root for your mother, like you support your mother against your aunt, and you support your aunt against you know, your neighbor, and you support the neighbor against someone in the next block, and so on. All of it is basically circles that are radiating, that are basically surrounding you, but you are in the center. Knowing this is extremely important, knowing that I am by nature inclined to injustice. Right or wrong? Right? Right. I am by nature inclined to injustice. What do you want to say? You're laughing. Hmm. 
إنه كان ظلوما جهولا he was ظلوم oppressor جهول ignorant that's the description of man because ظلم and جهل they, 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 they come from this egotism they come from this egotism so if I am inclined to these things then I have to put effort then every time I every time I engage in a discussion with my spouse I should be vigilant I should be careful I should be cautious because I know that unless I am cautious and vigilant and aware of my own inclination and tendency towards aggression, injustice, partiality, selfishness, then I will fail. Then I will oppress her or him. Uh, and and I, I, will, I will fail the test. So being aware of this is extremely important. And in this case, you need to always be uh, reminding yourself, I should discharge my obligations before I ask for my rights. And then, not only that, but I should not be uh, basically uh, miserly with, my, with, with either one, obligations or rights. The Bukhari and Muslim report from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, this, this is in, in relation to governance, the relationship between the, gover the govern governors and the governed, uh, but, uh, but it, it it is basically the general implication of it applies across the board. Where the Prophet said to Abdullah ibn Sa'ud, To adun alladhi alaykum wa tas'alun Allah alladhi lakum. To adun alladhi alaykum. Basically, you discharge your obligations, you do that which is upon you, your ob the obligations upon you, wa tas'alun Allah alladhi lakum. And you ask Allah for that which is yours. First, you are discharging all of your obligations. Second, you're asking Allah for your rights. So you, you, you discharge all of your obligations and after you have done this, you say to Allah, رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذَرِيَاتِنَا قَرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لَمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Allah, you know, make our wives and our uh, children uh, a comfort for our eyes or make our, of our wives and our children a comfort for our eyes. Uh, and make us of the leaders among the pious or the leaders of the pious so you, but this is after you have discharged your obligations you show Allah that you have done your part you have perfected it you have done this charger and then you say to Allah now I ask you to soften her heart or his heart I ask you to guide them to you know treat me well, uh, to guide her or him, to treat me well. But how many of us do this? And how many of us wait, wait until they have received their rights to discharge their obligations? And then we get into this, basically the chicken and the egg. You know, is the chicken first or the egg? She's waiting because you're not, you have not been uh, basically supportive of the family. Oh, it's, it's over? Okay. Huh? Uh, we, we have like five minutes, and we already have the time pressure. Oh, then I thought... Uh, uh, no, 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 just, to, you know, but finish this particular point, and then that's it. But it is... This particular issue is extremely important. What you, what you need to do in addition to this, in addition to the, the basically doing everything upon you first and then asking for that which is yours afterwards, but also you discharge your obligations uh, completely with ihsan, perfection, and then you ask for most of your rights, not all of your rights. As Abdullah ibn Abbas told us, uh, we, we'll discuss this inshallah next time. But, but if you ask for 100% of your rights, Abdullah ibn Abbas said that I never ask for my full rights. 
I never asked uh, for my wife for my full rights, or of my wife. Uh, I never asked of my full rights from my wife. Be because if you don't leave a question of safety, a margin of safety, a buffer zone, then life will be, uh, between you will, will be a series of conflicts. Because if you want 100% of your rights and she wants 100% of your rights, then that fine line in the middle between you and her, we will never be able to not cross it. You will cross this way, she will cross that way, and then you will never be face to face anymore. You'll be back to back and you'll be walking in two different directions by crossing the lines. But even if you were able to stand by the line and you have the smartest and astuteness to stand just by the line, it will be nose to nose all the time. It will be friction. And that, that, that is not life. That is not tranquility, that's not harmony, that is not peace, uh, and, and that, that is not uh, life. Inshallah, next time we'll go over the uh, two other concepts. Uh, the two other concepts are the concept of Qiwama and the concept of, um, you know, the, the, the concept of human nature, understanding human nature, the mixed nature of humanity. Inshallah, then I'll leave this for next time.